Who has it signed in? You need a study sheet. Anybody else need to sign in or need a study sheet? Okay. Very good. All right. <clears throat> Tonight. Um, many of us practice what I will call distracted listening. That's what some of you are doing right now, by the way. And I see you, so don't think that you can hide. All right. Uh, many of us practice distracted listening. We will have um, maybe our spouse or our children or our uh, friend uh, talking to us while we're trying to watch TV or while we're trying to look at our phone and see if we have any texts or email or while we're trying to read a book and we are trying to do both at the same time and while it's pretty well determined that men can only do one thing at a time. Uh, research indicates that women can only do one thing at a time. Okay? That any kind of kind of multitasking, <coughs> male or female, is not done well. Okay? So tell me what happens when you have distracted listening. You miss bits and pieces. You miss bits and pieces. What else happens, or where does missing bits and pieces lead to? Misunderstanding. Okay, because you haven't been listening wholeheartedly, it leads to misunderstandings. What else? <laughs> yeah. This person's been trying to, to uh, pour out their uh, their uh, thoughts to you. Yeah. Oh yeah, what was it you were talking about? Which leads to what? Eventual frustration. Yeah. Frustration by that person. I'm trying to talk to you, and you're not listening to me. Where else? No, no, never mind. Yeah, never mind. You're not going to listen to me. Never mind. Where else does distracted listening lead? Oh, me. Because I'm getting older, hearing's getting a little not as good as it used to be. My mind will fill in the blank on what I thought I heard. It's normally not right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And so again, it leads to a lack of understanding. It leads to a lack of connection. It leads to a lack of connection. So let's get into Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter six, nine through the first part of verse 11. Somebody read those for us, please. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Let them glean the remnant of Israel as thoroughly as a vine. Pass your hand over the branches again like one gathering grapes. To whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed so they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. But I am full of the wrath of the Lord and I cannot hold it in. I, I keep bringing this out, I know, and you all may be tired of hearing it, but it just keeps um, astounding me to, to read uh, the assessment over and over <coughs> about God's people. These are God's people. This is not, these are not worldly people in the sense that they're apart from God. This is how God's people are responding to God. All right. And again, what does he say? And their ears are closed. They cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. The title of the lesson tonight is When God Stops Listening. The title of this lesson may disturb some people. To better help us understand, when do you stop 
listening to others. And I've already heard it dozens of times. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't agree with you. Okay, I want to go back to that and then I'll come to yours. The way you said that, Janelle, <laughs> it had feeling to it. Okay. Lots of experience. Lots of experience when you've heard it so many times. Mike said, when you disagree with it, why would you stop listening when you disagree? Because it irritates and frustrates me. Okay. You don't want to hear it because it's not what you believe. And so it's frustrating, irritating, get your emotions going. Don't want to listen to it. What else do you stop listening to? I always tell my boys, uh, I'm trying to do this. How you say something sometimes is more important than what you have to say. People will quit listening to you based on your tone. So what, what would be the tone that would cause you to stop listening? <clears throat> Overly assertive. Somebody, you don't like to be told what to do, Jeff. Is that what it is? And say that. <laughs> <laughs> you probably stop listening when people put words in your mouth too, don't you? <laughs> so tone sometimes affects how much we want to listen to someone. What else do you might you stop listening? Well, I'm, I'm surprised. I've got uh, three things that I thought maybe you all would jump on right away. Um, I stopped listening when someone's lying. Uh, I know they're making things up. Okay? And I, and I, I just stopped listening because I, I, there's no reality to it. Uh, I stopped listening when uh, a person's words are insincere. And you may say, well, how do you know they're insincere? Well, I, I don't always know, but a person may be saying the right things, but for various reasons, I may know that they don't really mean them. Okay? They may be manipulative. They may be covering up um, what they're, they're really feeling. And I wrote down uh, when people are speaking ignorantly. And what I mean by that, is, is sometimes people seem to think that they've stumbled on the secret to life when I know it's empty philosophy or just another fad. Okay? That seems to happen pretty frequently in our world today. Uh, people think that they found some great mystery. And all they found is what's been found again and again, and it was empty in the first time it was found, and it's still empty. Okay, so I, I don't I don't listen to that very long, and so the short of it is, I stop listening when people's words don't mean anything. Um, what we're going to look at tonight is. Um, about when God stops. <clears throat> so don't you think, I mean, this is kind of a conclusion here at the beginning of the class, but don't you think it becomes wearisome even to God to listen to words that don't mean anything? And that's what we're going to see tonight, is that God gets weary um, there are things, there are things even that we can engage in where God will say, I'm not going to listen to you under these circumstances. And we're going to look at a couple of those. Um, and so that leads to question number two, as we will see through Jeremiah's writings, there are times when God does stop listening. Why might it be disturbing that God stops listening? Why, why would that be disturbing? I mean, I, it's disturbing to me to think about it, that God would stop listening. So why would that be disturbing to you? 
we like the idea that he's just there when we need him. Okay. I like that anytime I want to, anytime I need to, I can call him. You mean there may be times he's he's not just standing by the proverbial phone waiting for me to call him? And the answer is maybe. Why else might it be disturbing if God stops listening? When it's not from their heart and it's not sincere. All right. When a person no dressing. when a person is not sincere, when a person's not speaking from the heart, when it's just superficial or it's manipulative or it's empty in some way. Why, why else might it be disturbing for God not to listen? Well, when you're trying to pray and if you're not being sincere, you know, and you're just doing the same things over and over again, it, it's just disturbing because your prayers are not, God's not going to listen to your prayers. And your prayers may not be the answer. All right. So the idea that God, when I set aside time to pray, and I do pray, and he may not be listening to me. And I count on him, as this Heather kind of alluded to. I, 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 I expect him to be available when I'm, I'm calling out to him. Why else would it be disturbing that God stops listening? Well, if you're I'm thinking about the context, his chosen people who are praying to Baal and these other idolistic gods, I, I can see them, you know, I don't even want to hear that. In fact, we're going to read that in a few minutes, Mike, uh, from Isaiah, where, he, where, where that's God's reaction. Um, how about this? I might be disturbed to know that God stops listening because I'm afraid he will miss something that he needs to do. Um, I may even have a confession. Uh, I, I may have a penitent heart. I, I may have a praise I want to offer up to him. And you mean he, he may not be listening when I offer those? I don't want him to miss those. Um. We're afraid that he will not be available when we need him most. That's kind of what uh, Heather was talking about. And, and what's interesting about our reaction to the fact that God may not listen at times is that it reveals our true view of God. If we think that God's only purpose in our lives is to be there in the crisis, we, we've, we've said something very significant about how we view God. Okay? And that gets back to that moralistic therapeutic deism that I talked about a few weeks ago. And that, because that's the essence of how God is viewed. He, he, he's, he's off somewhere, but he's there in a crisis if I need him. I can call on him if I need a crisis. Uh, but as far as a daily walk with him, I don't need him. Okay. In fact, he's kind of a, it's kind of a killjoy. I'd rather not have him around <laughs> unless there's a crisis that I need him to solve. And so that's what we see happening in Israel. That's how they see God as, as this um, crisis manager. Okay? That God is, is not involved in my life unless there's an emergency. And so the Israelites treated him that way, Jim. And it occurred to me that if he stopped listening, he may stop talking to you as well. And we see that in Scripture, too. And so we're going to come to that uh, later on in the lesson. Okay? Any other comments or questions uh, yeah. so far? I do. Yes. Um, I think another, I don't know, and seeing how these Israelites are after he's told them over and over again through the different prophets and how they insist on on 
you know, worshiping them all. And, um, I can't help but think that they decided to talk to God. They may have included some of the traditions, practices, or something during their prayer. So why would he want to listen to that? Yeah. Yeah. And so, again, what we have is it is something that is less than meaningful. Okay. Uh, I, I hesitated to say it was completely empty, but it's pretty close okay. to empty. So question number three, let's read Jeremiah 7, 12 through 20. Somebody jump on that for us. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. While you were doing all these things, declares okay. the Lord, I spoke. I, I want you to start at 13 again. Just want to mention, what does he say about Shiloh? Sorry, 13. Now, uh, verse 12. Mm -hmm. What does verse 12 say about Shiloh? It's where he first made a dwelling in his name. The All right. wickedness of my people. If you know, if you know anything about Israel's history, this was kind of the first holy place. Shiloh was the first holy place where God made his. What does he say about it in verse 12? He says we need to see what he did to it. Because, because of what? Of the wickedness. wickedness of my people. There is a history of treating God with contempt. Okay? Even in Shiloh, the, the first place that God placed his name, there was such a wickedness there that God had to do something about it. All right? So pick it up at 13 and keep going. While you were doing all these things, meaning the wicked things, right? Yes. Declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did to Shiloh, I will now do to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in, the place I gave to you and your ancestors. I will thrust you from my presence, just as I did all your fellow Israelites, the people of Ephraim. Okay, before you keep going. All right, where's the temple? I'm giving you the letter. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, thank you. The temple's in Jerusalem, all right? It's also where God has, has placed his name similar to how he did Shiloh. And what does he say? I'm going to have to treat Jerusalem the same way I treated Shiloh. Okay, why? They weren't obeying. Not only were they not obeying, they weren't, they weren't listening. We're listening. All right, keep going. 16. So do not pray for this people, nor offer any plea or petition for them. Do not plead with me, for I will not listen to you. Do you not see what they are doing in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers light the fire, and the women knead the dough and make cakes to offer to the Queen of Heaven. They pour out drink offerings to other gods to arouse my anger. But am I the one they are provoking, declares the Lord? Are they not rather harming themselves to their own shame? Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord <coughs> says. My anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place, on man and beast, on the trees of the field and on the crops of your land, and it will burn and not be quenched. Okay. So, um, God told Jeremiah not to pet pray for the people of Israel. This is a conversation, chapter 7, is a conversation between, it's more like a monologue, actually, uh, of God speaking to Jeremiah. And he says, Jeremiah, don't pray for the people of Israel because I will not listen to your prayer, if that's what you pray. Okay, so don't even waste your time praying to me for Israel. Why was God unwilling to listen to the prayers on Israel's behalf? There are several things. The end of verse 18 says that um, they pour out drink offerings to other gods to arouse my anger, as though they're doing it on purpose. 
It, it sounds like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which again speaks to this contempt that they had for God. Um, there was not the fear of the Lord there. All right. So one of the things that you're pointing out is they were engaging in idolatry. In particular, he mentions what? Who is the queen of heaven? All right. The queen of heaven is, um, is, is essentially a fertility God. All right. Uh, which entailed, it was part of Baal worship or Baal worship. Um, it was all kind of a, a sub um, under Baal worship okay. that, that, that oftentimes included um, uh, ritual prostitution. Um, but it was, again, something other than worshiping Yahweh. All right, so they were engaged in this um, in this idolatry. And here's what's interesting, he says. It's kind of, uh, it's easy to overlook it. He talks about every family member having a part of it. This was not just mom and dad. This wasn't just dad. This wasn't just mom. You know? Well, the women are going to worship the queen. of No, this was even the kids. Even the kids were engaging in this. Okay. So their, their engagement in idolatry, God said, don't, don't, even, don't even pray for them. What else was the reason? Well, we've already, ta already talked about this already in, in chapter 6. God wasn't listening to them because they stopped listening to him. Because they stopped listening to him. Okay. Um, verse... 14. Why do you stop? Why do you tell Jeremiah not to pray for them? Verse 14. What they trust in. Talked about this last week a little bit. They trusted in the temple. I, they're not, and, and that's kind of an interesting little side note, too. There is a difference between trusting in this and trusting in God. Now, okay, this is God's word. But your trust is not in the word, per se. Your trust is in the one who gave those words, okay? Your trust is not, I mean, I talked about this in a series on, on baptism the last couple of weeks. Your trust is not in baptism. Trust is in Jesus Christ, okay? And, and, and so they were, they were trusting in the temple. They said, you don't trust in the temple, you trust in me. So we have to make sure that distinction is made. And I've got one more thing. Um, and this, this relates to uh, what was said early. They were provoking God and they were harming themselves in the process. So God's judgment against Israel was set. So Jeremiah didn't need to intercede for him. Because it wasn't going to change anything. God was going to bring judgment. Okay. Too late to turn around at this point. So, Jeremiah, don't pray for him. I don't know about you, but when I read this, this is terrifying to me. To think that there comes a time when God says, too far gone. And it's not that we can't turn around. It's just that God knows we won't turn around. Okay? That turning around on our own is impossible. So he has to do something to get our attention. That's what he had to do with the Israelites. So let's turn to Isaiah, and then we'll 
uh, read First Peter three as well. Isaiah chapter one, ten through twenty. Can I read that, please? <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of the Lord. Okay, who's he talking to? That's that's a uh, that's a um, metaphor for who they are. Who's he talking to? Well, yeah, but they're particular wicked people. He's talking to Israel. Okay, he's talking to Israel. He calls him Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, keep going. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocation, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In your own words, what's their condition? You need to be obedient or else they're not going to win. They're worshiping God. What's the problem? They were doing it out of, they were not sincere with it. They were just doing it as a ritual. They became basically ritualistic. And I mean, it, 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 that carried over even in the New Testament with the Pharisees, kind of faith like that. Um, and it just, it, it was not meaningful anymore. Like, the, the picture here is not the same as Genesis. You see the offerings in Genesis, they were very sincere of those folks. Like the, the, the very day of the patriots. And, and you see how everything changed. Um, they basically were, were doing it out of, with no meaning. What do we get babies who cry in order to stop them from crying as big babies. What do we give them? We give them a pacifier. <clears throat> I think God deals with pacifiers. Because that's what this was. This was their effort to pacify God. We're bringing you sacrifices. We're praying to you. We're celebrating the feasts. God what did God say? In their heart. He what? What's in their heart? It wasn't, they didn't mean it. All right. It's so like Art said, they were, they were going through the motions. It became ritual. You just seem so exhausted and so frustrated in these verses. That's he does. Yeah. And so does it surprise you to hear him say, 
Don't bring me any sacrifices. Don't lift up any prayers. I'm sick of this. It, it, it's empty. It's, um, it wears me out. I'm not listening. That's a problem. Well, I mean, it's a pretty human reaction. It's scary. Where this world is open. But how does this section end? He tells them what to do. What do they need to do? Wash yeah. themselves, cleanse themselves. Go from Scarlet to Wool. Hey, I, I'm not writing you off. I, I, it, if we just sit down and talk about this and, and you would turn to me, I, I I cleanse you. If you would just turn to me. But until they do, he wasn't listening. First Peter chapter three and verse seven. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. All right. We learn something about the nature of God by examining when he stops listening. When are some additional times that God stops listening to people? And why do you think he stops listening in those times? So we've read in Isaiah 1, God says, close the temple, shut down the sacrifices, quit burning incense, stop the prayers. Israel was guilty of the evils of injustice and lack of compassion toward the most vulnerable, which would be the orphans and widows. They were. This was meaningless. Okay, it would be comparable to me getting up and talking and, and preaching on being merciful to uh, the homeless, you walking out and saying, that was a great sermon, and then you see a homeless person on your way home, and, um, and, and you beat the horn at them and say, get out of the way! It didn't, it didn't mean anything. It, it, it didn't sink in. What are some other times, and we read one in 1 Peter chapter 3, when God, and also in Isaiah 1, when God stops listening. I mean, several times in Jeremiah, God will say, I'm not listening. We're going to read some more in just a moment. What are some times that God stops listening? What do you see for, uh, in either Isaiah 1, verse 15, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, also in Isaiah chapter 1? There's, there's, a, there's a couple of occasions he explains why. Inconsiderate disrespect. Wait, which which Wait, ones are? Um, in 1 Peter, it says that... Uh, in the same way husbands be considerate so we need to be considerate to God and then um, all right the let's look at that verse how does he end that verse as you live with your wives that's oh, not the way it is verse. oh sorry that's that's the and treat them with the respect as the weaker partner and You're the heirs the with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers how does it end if we don't do that, our prayers are hindered. No? There is something that can hinder our prayers. In other words, there, there are, there's something that husbands in particular can do that will cause God to quit listening to them. What is it? What does he say in verse 7? If, if you don't if you mistreat your wives, God's not going to listen to you. You're not going to pay attention to your prayer. You, you want your prayers to be revitalized? Start treating your wife right. 
Okay? So God stops listening to the guy who's not treating his wife right. Isaiah 1, what do you see? And we, again, we've touched on him some already. What does he, when does he say, I'm going to stop listening? He says your hands are full of blood. What's he talking about? Is right. that all the sins they haven't repented? He, he's, he's talking specifically about the injustice, okay, that's going on in the land. You got enough money, you're okay. Uh, you're poor, you're uh, um, one of the vulnerable, uh, you, may, you may get walked on, okay? So there's injustice in the land. He's probably referring to the practice that was um, happening in some places, and that is the sacrifice of children, okay? To appease the gods that they were worshiping, all right? So, and, and so, um, and there was probably also some, through injustice, uh, there were some people who were shedding blood who were dying because um, they had been treated unjustly. So he said, I'm, I'm not listening to people who are treating one another like this. There's injustice in the land. Your, your, your lack of compassion, your lack of mercy is not is not my character, and so I'm not listening. And then um, we talked about the ritual of religion. He said, I'm not listening if you're just if it's just ritual. And so here are the Israelites engaging in all this religious activity, but it was killing them because nothing was genuine, nothing was sincere. Nothing was meaningful. They weren't, their lives were not being affected by their relationship with God. Who are we supposed to be coming more and more like every day? Thank you, Jesus. And so what God is effectively saying that maybe we can relate to and tie to us is if you're not becoming, I mean, again, he's not expecting perfection. He knows we're made of dust, Psalm 103. But if we're not in the process of becoming, at some point God says, I'm not listening because this is not registered. Okay, come come to me with a penitent heart. Come to me with a broken heart. I can I can work with that, David. You are a royal sinner, but you came to me with a broken heart. I can do something with that. I can't do anything with these hard hearts. Right? That's what that's what God's saying to Jeremiah. Questions, comments. Jeremiah 11, 9 through 14. <laughs> then the Lord said to me, there is a conspiracy among the people of Judah and those who live in Jerusalem. They have returned to the sins of their ancestors who refused to listen to my words. They have followed other gods to serve them. Both Israel and Judah have broken the covenant I made with their ancestors. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will bring on them a disaster they cannot escape. Although they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. The towns of Judah and the people of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gods to whom they burn incense, but they <clears throat> will not help them at all when disaster strikes. You, Judah, have as many gods as you have towns, and the altars you have set up to set up to burn incense to that shameful god Baal are as many as the streets in Jerusalem. Do not pray for this for this people, or offer any plea or petition for them, because I will not listen when they call to me at the time of their distress. 
What? <laughs> yes, that's it. Yes. God, God was incensed that despite all the blessings he had given Israel, they worshiped other gods. They had as many gods as they had streets. Streets. And altars to Baal as they had um, streets. Yeah. Okay. As many um, gods as they had towns, as many altars as they had streets. Under these circumstances, why would God stop listening? Remember one of our early lessons? We talked about who you listen to, and you know, the false prophets were saying, Peace, everything's okay. I, I know, I know Babylon's out there, and they're headed this way, but we're okay because we got the temple. You got the temple. All the time, Jeremiah is saying, we're going down. We're going down. We're going down. Shut up, Jeremiah. We don't want to hear from you. So a lot of them were still probably at ease thinking, well, nothing's happened yet. I know Jeremiah has been talking about this for a long time, but nothing's happened yet. We're, we're okay. We're okay. <coughs> and so we see God patience and his long suffering. And, but at some point, he fulfills his word. So, again, under what circumstance, under these circumstances, why would God stop listening? Well, just a little bit more history about Baal or Baal. The God Baal is represented by a bull or a ram. Uh, he was worshipped in hopes of producing crops and children. A hallmark of Baal worship was pig slaughter and sacrifice. Worship included sensuality and ritualistic prostitution. It might also include child sacrifice and crazed self-inflicted wounding. People would cut themselves and be bleeding. Uh, if you can imagine you know, a group of people getting together and they're cutting themselves and they're running around and, you know, blood everywhere. They've broken the covenant. Uh, it, it was like an unrepentant spouse engaged in adultery. Now, here's the, here's the thing that we have to remember. Who created the wall? There was a wall between God and the people of Israel. Who created the wall? The people of Israel. God didn't create that wall. That was the farthest thing from God. They created the wall. God just honored their creating a wall by not listening because they no longer honored their exclusive relationship with him. Okay, you're going to build a wall between you and me. I'll honor your wall. And I won't, I won't listen anymore. Okay. Which, again, kind of an aside note, I always try to bring the context of Jeremiah's day into ours. What's so fascinating to me about humans, <coughs> and I see this, you know, pretty commonly. It is, is people will, will, will um, people will build a similar wall in their own lives between them and God. And, and, and then when they start to experience the consequences of it, who do they blame? God. God didn't build that wall. You built that wall. There's a wall there because you built it because you wouldn't turn him. That's what the Israelites are ultimately going to, to um, experience. Okay? <clears throat> Comments, questions? Jeremiah 14, 11 through 16. 
Then the Lord said to me, do not pray for the well-being of these people. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, famine, and plague. But I said, alas, sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling them, you will not see the sword or suffer famine. Indeed, I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies among them. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they are saying, no sword or famine will touch this land. Those same prophets will perish by sword and famine. And the people they are prophesying to will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and sword. There will be no one to bury them, their wives, their sons, and their daughters. I will pour out on them the calamity they deserve. So they won't even get the dignity of having a proper burial when God's judgment finally comes. The word of God conflicted with the words of the false prophets, yet the people of Israel accepted the words of the false prophets, so God wouldn't listen to their prayers or acknowledge their fasting and sacrifices. He told Jeremiah again, don't pray for them. I don't even want to hear you mention their names. Why did Israel prefer the words of the false prophets? We talked about this a little bit in some of the earlier lessons. Why did they prefer the words of the false prophets? Because they said what Israel wanted to hear. I mean, that's the bottom line. Um, the false prophets were popular because they said the things. And what was it in particular he said that they that they, that they would tell the people? Sword and nothing bad is going to happen. We're going to have peace. There's not going to be a. We won't have to deal with a famine. We're not going to have to deal with the sword. All those things Jeremiah keeps saying, he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's not going to happen. You're okay. You're okay. I mean, I, I think about the repercussions of that as, as a spokesman for God. And I get a little bit angry, I have to tell you, because I see a similar kind of message being sent even today. You're okay. Hey, you know, all the things you read in the Bible, they, they don't really mean that. Not really true. You, you know, things have changed. Um, who are you going to listen to? Who are you going to listen to? And, and like in Jeremiah's day, um, the voices that talk of the judgment of God are in, are in the minority and not very popular. But um, I don't know about you. I want to hear the truth even when it's hard to hear. Because if you're lying to me, even though it sounds good, it's nothing. It's empty. Yeah, that's what they were li listening to. All right, Jeremiah 29, 10 through 12. Let's put a positive ending on this pretty dismal um, reality we've been reading about tonight. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray <coughs> to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Okay. Did you notice the change? There was a very significant change in something he said in this passage versus what we've been doing. What was it? That's still with the title of the lesson. I'll start listening. I'll start listening. 
all these other times he said, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. I'll start listening. Now, let me just scan, kind of say a side note here. This passage we just read is a favorite of a lot of people. I've never had anybody say, my favorites, Jeremiah 11, 9 through 14, uh, Jeremiah 7, 12 through 20, <laughs> Jeremiah 6, 9 through 11. Are we a lot different? We're not a lot different, are we? I, well, I like Jeremiah 29 because it talks about, hey, I've got good things in mind for you. Well, I like that. I like that. And so, again, just a side note, um, a lot of people love to pick and choose verses in the Bible as though the Bible's kind of this buffet that I like that verse. So, I, you know, let's get a plaque of that. And that would be my favorite verse from now on. And never read the context because if you read the entirety of Jeremiah 29, you know what he's still talking about? Judgment. That's what the bulk of Jeremiah 29 is talking about. It's just in this little window, God says, listen, you will find me when you, when you seek me with all your heart. And, and I'm going to do, I've got great things for you. I've got restoration in mind for you. But you have to seek me with all your heart. So real quick, what did you learn about God tonight? What did you learn about God? He can turn away. He can turn away. Keep going. He can't see and know Yeah, if we're sincere with him, if we got a pen in the heart, he will start listening again. What else? He gets fed up. He gets fed up. He'll have consequences. Choices have consequences. <clears throat> Anything else? Again, what I love about Jeremiah is Jeremiah gives an honest picture of the heart and nature of God. And he is exceptionally faithful and patient and loving and forgiving. But we can't take him for granted. He will not be taken for granted. He will not be taken for granted. Yeah, I have a question. So, if in those seven, that seventy year span, and yeah. there were some people that were sincere and really praying to God, and there were, yeah. And so I'm saying, then he was listening to them because they passed away. Mm -hmm. You know, they're asking for forgiveness. They still have that opportunity. That's right. It, it just again, another little side note. Uh, you know who read this passage about uh, seventy years? You remember who read about that? Daniel. D Daniel's in Babylonian captivity. He reads Jeremiah's prophecy about 70 years, and he calculates, and he says, hey, we're getting close to the end of 70 years. You know what D D Daniel did? He started praying to God, a prayer of repentance. God, me and my ancestors have been sinful. We have been wrong. We have been wicked. Please, for he starts preparing for the end of the 70 years so God can bring the restoration that he promised. Isn't that pretty neat? You know, there are a lot of people who may not have believed Jeremiah, but Daniel did. Daniel did. He knew that Daniel, that Jeremiah was uh, telling the truth. I just feel like we're getting started right now. So, but we'll have to save it until next week. So uh, have a blessed week.